All right, welcome to Ponce Church. Does Jesus know you? This is an important question. Does Jesus know you? Yes. Now, as Creator, He knows everyone, right? The scriptures yes. say He knows the hairs on our head, yes. right? For some of us, it's not that hard, but for you know, for others, it could be tough. But He knows the hairs of our head. Uh, the scriptures say he makes his sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and he makes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So as creator, certainly he knows everyone. But maybe a better question is, does he recognize you as part of his family? See, that's a, does he know you in that way? Does he see that you're part of his family? He knows Lucifer, right? He created Lucifer, knows everything about Lucifer. But would you say Lucifer is part of his family? Doesn't appear to be. He knows Judas, knew Judas, left and right, or inside and out. But would you say Judas is part of his family? See, there's a, there's a difference there of Jesus saying, I know you in that way. He knew the Pharisees, but a lot of them didn't seem to be part of his family. So my question to you is, does Jesus know you in that way, as part of his family? It's a very, very uh, important question to uh, ask, because if you're reading the scriptures, remember the, the, the story of the 10 bridesmaids? Well, there were 10 of them, five of them he knew and what did he say to the other five? Do you remember? I don't know you. I don't know you. Look at that. Matthew 25, 12. But he called back. He's talking to the bridesmaids. He says, believe me, I don't know you. Those are, those are some sobering words, right? Those are words no human being ever wants to hear. Jesus looking you in the face and saying, I don't know you. Now they knew him, right? All 10 of them knew him. He was the bridegroom. They all knew him. They were living their life for him. But he said, I don't even know five of you. I don't know you, he says. And so what we're talking about today is Jesus must know me. He must recognize me as part of his family. And I ask you, does Jesus know you? Look at this. 2 Timothy 2.12, Paul's writing to, uh, to a, a young minister, Timothy, but God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription. Notice, God's truth stands firm <clears throat> like a foundation stone with this inscription. The Lord, what? Knows those who are his. John 10.14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. So can you see there's a difference in scripture between knowing Jesus? Everybody knows Jesus, isn't that right? He's pretty famous. <laughs> I think everybody in America has heard of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Almost every human being on the planet has heard of Jesus. You know, there may be millions that haven't. But out of the seven billion, a lot have heard of Jesus. So in this country, if we're talking just in this country, everybody knows Jesus. My question to you today is, does he know you? That's completely different. Does he know you? The scriptures make a difference between knowing him and him knowing me. Well, in my life, I've heard these uh, different, uh, you know, versions of this just throughout my, my life in America, you know, life in a Christian area where, where Christ is proclaimed, freely proclaimed, pro proclaimed. And you'll hear things like the world might say something like this, just be a good person and he will know you. A lot of people are counting on that, aren't they? I just, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. So I must be part of God's family. He must know me because I'm a good person. And then if you have followed in my circles uh, for the last 45 years of my Christian life, I was always told, well, get to know him. 
and he will know you. And I've spent my whole life getting to know him, reading the Bible over and over and over and over, all the way through, back and forth, reading it over and over, 45 years of study, 25 years in, in full-time ministry, study, prayer, meditation, getting to know him. And I certainly know him. I'd be, uh, you know, pretty dull if I didn't know him. But my question still remains, does he know me? And I'm telling you, that's a more important question. Anybody can know him. Does he know me? And then I was told this, and, and most Christians come through some form of this, well, at least, uh, you know, a, a lot of them in this country, believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, love Jesus, and he will know you. Let me demonstrate what this is like. Everybody say, knock, knock. knock, knock. All right. Let's say that somebody knocks on your door this afternoon. You're at home, you know, whatever, probably, let's see, Sunday afternoon, you're probably in prayer and deep meditation and reading those scriptures. You might be watching TV, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> knock on the door and you open the door and he says, he says, hi, my name's Rick. I'm a good person. I don't cause any trouble. I, I treat everybody nice. I'm uh, uh, in good standing. I have an ID card, a membership card in, in, a, in the good person society. I'm a good person. I can prove to you I'm a good person. Just look at me. I look okay. I'm a good person. That's all great. But what if I say this to you? Or, or the stranger says this to you. And I want to move into your house today and live with you forever. What are you going to say? Hmm? What are you going to say? You've never met this guy in your life. What are you going to say? Okay, listen. If this sounds like a good idea to you, see me after, give me your address, and put square footage under there. I'd like to know what, where I'm moving into. We're not letting that happen, right? We're not. Are you? You're not. Come on. If if don't 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 play this out. Just uh, just in that, that scenario, a stranger knocks on your door, says, "I'm a good person. Let me live in your home." What's the answer? No. no. And why? I don't know you. I don't know you. Isn't that right? You might be a good person. I don't know you though. From all accounts, uh, I can't think of his, his, his name now, but there was a Ted Bundy. He was very charming, very charming guy. I don't know you. Isn't that right in this world? Isn't that, isn't that the truth? I just, I don't know you. I might, I might befriend you, I might like you. You're not moving in with me. Say I got three kids at home and a, a wife and three kids. I'm not bringing you into my home. You're not moving in with me because what? I don't know you. What if he says this? Knock, knock. Everybody say knock, knock. Knock, knock. You open the door. Hi, I'm Rick. I know everything about you. I've followed you my whole life. I tell everybody about you. I even sing to you in the shower. And I want to move in with you and live with you forever. In this world, what are you going to say? That's even worse than the first guy, right? That's a, that's a creeper, isn't that right? Uh, uh, our younger son, Bob and Mary, they would, they would call that sketchy. That's sketchy. That's a stalker. It's worse. It's better just to try and get in on being a good person. But you tell me that you know everything about me? And you sing to me. Believe me. How about this one? I, I let's just put it in, in Christian terms. Knock knock. Everybody say knock knock. Knock knock. knock, knock. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I worship Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I'm trusting Jesus for you to let me into your house forever. I know Jesus. What's the answer still? I don't know you. I don't know you. 
Anybody can say anything, isn't that right? Anybody can say anything. I don't know you. I'm telling you, folks, it's, it's the same way with God. People are going to be knocking on his door, and they got all kinds of reasons to, to let them, hit them in. And the only issue is, do I know you? If I know you, wonderful. Welcome. Come on in. You're part of my family. But if I don't know you, Jesus says, I don't know you. Look what he says in Matthew 7, 22. On Judgment Day. See, this is going to happen. What we've been talking about, this is going to happen. People are going to knock, knock on Judgment Day's door. They're going to knock. Who? How many are going to want to go to heaven on Judgment Day? Yes. If they realize all of a sudden, uh-oh, there's Jesus. There's 100 million angels. There's two camps, sheep and goats. I want to be a sheep. Now, maybe too late on that day, but we're all going to want to. Look what he says, on Judgment Day, <laughs> many will say to me, what? Did you marry? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I see the thing popping out here. Well, it might be this battery, I don't know. <clears throat> on Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Look at that, in your name even. And cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. Would you say that those people knew this Lord? I'm calling him Jesus because he said, many are going to say to me, Jesus, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, we performed many miracles in your name. In other words, Jesus, we love you, we know you, we believe in you, we trust you to let us in. Let me into your house. You can just turn the sound off. Yeah, it's your battery. I don't know. Talk loud. I don't know. They knew him real well. But notice Jesus' reply, verse 23. But I will reply, and I'm taking four words out. You can guess what they are in a minute. I'm taking four words out, and we'll get to them in a minute. But I will reply... On Judgment Day, knock, knock, let me in. I know you. I know all about you. I love you. I trust you. I worship you. I do all kinds of things in your name. Let me into your heaven. <clears throat> let me into your house. But I will reply, get away from me, you who break God's laws, and why... Are, are, why are some people, not even some, the scary word there is many. Why? Why are some people going to hear that? Because the four words I took out were, but I will reply, let's all say it together, I, I never, never knew, knew you. you. Jesus, I know you. He replies, I don't know you. And you just, you proved to me in this life, that's not going to fly. If I don't know you, you're not coming in. I may like you, I may help you, I may do what I can for you, but you're not moving in. You're not going to live with me forever. I never knew you. So the question is, you may know him, but does he know you. Everybody say how. How. How do we get recognized as part of his family? Now you're going to have all kinds of ways and reasons. Everybody got their thing, you know. And almost all of them, listen to me, almost all of them have to do with you knowing him. You doing something for him. You trusting him. You for him. My question to you is, how does he know you? How does he recognize you as part of his family. How? Well, you're going to have to come back next week to find out. Thanks for coming today. <laughs> How does he know me? Look at this verse.
just before the two verses we just read, before he said, on judgment day, many will say, I know you, I love you, I trust you, I've done many work, wonderful things, and I'm going to say, I don't know you. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Can't anybody call out, Lord, Lord? Do you have to change your life to call out, Lord, Lord? Does anything inside have to change for you to call out, Lord, Lord? He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those, only those who actually, what? Do the will of my Father in heaven will, what? Enter. <clears throat> so if I said, how do we enter? How do we get recognized as part of his family? How does how do we live our life to where he knows me, not just me know him, he knows me, could we at least say at the beginning here, those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will, what, enter. Those who actually do. Not those who know me. Anybody can know him. Every person sitting in church this morning in America knows me. But are you, listen folks, are you actually doing his will? Are you obeying him? That's who he knows. He knows those who actually do. And listen, there is a price to disobedience. Nobody believes this. There is a price for disobeying Jesus. Everybody thinks we're just skating. Yeah, you are skating, but you're skating till judgment day. Yes. <laughs> Everybody gets to skate right now. But only those who actually do his will will enter. Those are the words of Jesus. There's no other words that nullify the words of Jesus. There's a steep price, I'm going to say today, uh, for disobedience, not doing the will of my Father in heaven. And, then, and the price here is you won't enter. Serious, serious, serious repercussions for disobedience. My homeless friends have taught me that. We've been serving the homeless for over five years. I know, I know, literally, personally know dozens and dozens of them, and, and I'm, I'm acquainted with hundreds of them. And one thing they taught me, and I had great mercy for them, <clears throat> because I see that. That's how God treats me. I'm messed up, according to Jesus. You know, I don't measure up to Jesus, but he shows mercy on me. So I look at homeless people, and that just, that just happens to be the ministry God connected us to, and I have great mercy for them. But listen to this lesson they've taught me. There are serious repercussions to disobedience. That's what they taught me, because their lives are full and overflowing with disobedience. They don't think right, they don't talk right, they don't act right, they are full of all kinds of bitterness or unforgiveness. Not all of them, I'm just saying, you know, the, the different world, different ones of us have different thing, issues going on. But their lives are, are full of these things. You know, one of the major things is just is just dishonesty or lying or stealing or cheating. Constant. We had a lady tell us yesterday she can't put her stuff down. Because why? It gets stolen. It gets stolen every single time. There is so much disobedience, and that's why we've kind of outcast them. There's disobedience. But we don't see that that we have a log in our eye and they have a speck in theirs. All we see is their their terrible speck. And it looks so evil. But their lives are full of disobedience and they are suffering, folks. They are suffering for their sin. It's heartbreaking. But it proved to me, man, you want to disobey God? There's a steep price to pay. Live in your own life full of lust or addiction or just, just disobeying God, not doing his will. Now, come over here to Ponce Inlet, where I live. 
We got a whole different set of issues here. Listen, folks, the same disobedience. Maybe not disobedience in that area. Last week I taught that the first tenth of our increase in income, the first tenth is for the poor. God set that apart thousands of years ago, before the law, Abraham and Melchizedek. Before the law, all throughout the law and the prophets, Abraham, the law, the prophets, Jesus, Paul, the book of Acts, you, you will always see it. Not one building was ever built or paid for in, in anywhere in the New Testament, not once ever, but every single time money is mentioned, it always went to the poor. And God says the first tenth of everything you have is for the poor. Nobody's doing that, but nobody cares. That, that equals $200 billion a year in America, and nobody cares because we don't believe there's a serious repercussion for that crime. We don't believe it. We just don't believe it. You know why I don't believe it? Because I'm comfortable. I know there are serious repercussions for disobedience because I see those people. Here, there's no serious repercussions. I'm going to go home when this is over. I'm going to eat a big meal. I'm going to set a nice soft chair in my air-conditioned room as I drive my car home and back, and I'm going to be very comfortable today and thanking God for it. So it doesn't seem like there's any repercussions to any disobedience. I'm, I'm doing fine. And I'm telling you, folks, there are serious repercussions to disobey. You know what the serious repercussion is to disobeying Jesus on this earth? I don't care how comfortable you are. I don't know you. You tell me if that's not serious. You hear those words? But Jesus, I know you. I don't know you. Only those who actually do my will will enter. The second thing, first thing, how's he going to recognize us? Well, those who do his will will enter. Those who do his will, he recognizes as part of his family. And here's the second one, and, and this one will start winding us down. The second thing is actually part of the first one. You will listen, you will be a person who connects to people in trouble. If you had to say something about Jesus, would that be a, a, a short definition of Jesus? He spent his time here on earth connecting to people in trouble. Yes. Wouldn't that have, just read the Gospels and see if that's not what he did. Just, now, sometimes trouble came to him, right? <laughs> they, were, they were looking to trip him up. But what he would do is connect to people in trouble. I know I've said this 10,000 times, I'm gonna keep saying it 10,000 more until number one, you get it, until you, all your friends get it, all your family gets it, all your neighbors get it, until the whole world gets it. You wanna go to heaven, you must actually do the will of his father. You must to enter. What does that mean? Connect to people in trouble. You remember the rich man and the beggar Lazarus? Yes. The rich man just passed him by every day. He didn't connect. <clears throat> the beggar was sitting right there every day, in and out, in and out, in and out. He never connected. And he didn't enter. He did not enter into Abraham's bosom. How about the good, good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite? They just passed by, they didn't connect. But the Good Samaritan, he went to the man in the ditch. He initiated contact. He went to that person in trouble. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Because the original question was, how do I inherit eternal life? In Matthew 25, read the parable, we mentioned it earlier, the sheep and the goats. On Judgment Day, Jesus is going to return. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And the goats, just read it. Read the description of the goats. They were people on this earth who did not, they just refused to, they neglected to, they were too busy 
too much life going on, and I understand that. I understand life gets crazy, but this has to come first. Connect to people in trouble. It'll actually help your life. It'll actually help straighten out your life a little bit. <laughs> it actually brings some, brings some peace and heaven to it. The, the more messed up your life is right now, the more important it is to go connect to somebody worse off than you. Connect to people in trouble. The goats didn't. The sheep did. That's the only difference that Jesus recognized. And I'm telling you today, folks, that only those who obey, that if you obey the will of my Father, if you connect to people in trouble, Amen. on that day, I don't know you. I don't know, I don't know what's more important than that, you know. <laughs> I think about myself, and I, you know, I like to apply my own sermons to me when I'm when I'm preparing them. So knock knock. Here's Rick at heaven's door. Knock knock. What's he going to say to me? And I have to look at my life. Is he going to say to me, "I know you. You're that guy that that connected to the homeless while you were down here. You went out of your way. You did something." Oh yeah, yeah. I know you. You're that guy that preached for 20 years. <laughs> that people are supposed to connect to people in trouble because when they connect to those people, they're actually really connecting to Jesus himself. Amen. That's what he said. Amen. You're that guy. As a matter of fact, I remember you. You're that guy that wouldn't shut up. Huh? <laughs> Amen. Thank God for it. Yeah. Sometimes he would tell me, he'd be like, Rick, give it a break. I'd be like, no, it's too important. <laughs> Sometimes he don't tell me that. You know, give it a break. I go, no, I can't. <laughs> Every day it gets closer. <clears throat> knock, knock. Let me in because I'm a good person, because I'm perfect, and because I'm holy. Man, if you're depending on that, folks, oh my goodness. That ain't going to work. <coughs> or, like I've always taught, been taught my whole life, not not let me in because I know Jesus. <coughs> I trust Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. Did you obey him? No, I don't have to obey him. <coughs> Did you actually do his will? No. Did you ever spend any time whatsoever <coughs> connecting to people in trouble? No. But I know Jesus. I love Jesus. I worship Jesus. And I believe in Jesus, and I trust him to let me in. Stranger knocks on my door today and tells me all that stuff. I'm not letting you in, man. I'm just not. I might try and help you, but I'm not letting you in. Now, my sons or daughters-in-law knock on my door this afternoon and says, I need to come in and live with you. You're in. You're in for as long as you need to be. I may rue that decision later, but you're in. <laughs> Why? Why am I letting them in? Because I know you. You're part of me. You're welcome. You're welcome in. Are you going to hear that? Are you going to hear that on that day? I think about it. I think, am I going to hear that? What else matters? What else matters? Being popular, does that matter? As a minister, what else matters? Am I going to hear that on that day? Are the people I proclaim the gospel to going to hear that on that day? I'm a colossal failure if they don't. All right, real quick. Some people in trouble. I just want to run off a list of people according to Matthew 25 and other scriptures. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I needed shelter and, and you helped me and sheltered me. These are all people in trouble that are listed by Jesus himself. I was sick. 
or in the hospital or sick at home and you visited me. I was a prisoner and you came and visited me. I was an addict or an alcoholic and you, and you sought to help me. I was laying in a ditch in life and you came and, and, and helped me get back on my feet. And I was an outcast of society or a leper. I was a widow or I was lonely and you came and visited me. I was a single mom and you took me under your wing and you helped me because life is so hard. Did you connect to somebody in trouble? That's it. <laughs> that's, that's the family. Somebody with that heart, Jesus recognizes that heart. He says, wow, they're just like me. Maybe the orphan. There's a half a million of them. Or, or in foster care, I mean. You know, you can be a mentor. You can go to a one-day class, about eight hours or so. We, we did the classes ourselves. But you can go, and you can be a mentor to, to foster kids one day a month if you want to. And you can do anything you want with them. They're usually high school kids that ask for a mentor. There's literally hundreds of thousands of these kids in our country. Nobody takes an interest. Because this isn't important to us. It just isn't important. It doesn't register. Maybe the poor, like we do with the homeless, the underserved, you know, people that's in trouble. And a lot of times foreigners, just people they, they, they don't necessarily fit into our, our culture. Connect to people in trouble. I was hungry, and you did something about it. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hey, uh, let's uh, thank Facebook for joining us today. Honey, you want to stop that? <laughs> yes. I was posting one more on your feed. All right. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and